Save on O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner. Get two cans of O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner for just $8. Valid in-store only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to Heritage Voices, episode 47. I'm Jessica Uquinto, and I'll be your host today. And today we're talking about the National Park Service Native American Affairs Program. Before we begin, I'd like to honor and acknowledge that the lands I'm recording on today are part of the Nooch, or Ute Peoples Treaty Lands, the Dineta, and the Ancestral Pueblo and Homeland. Today we have Dorothy Firecloud on the show. Dorothy Firecloud is a member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. She has a JD from the New Mexico School of Law and has been a member of the New Mexico State Bar since 1991. Ms. Firecloud has worked with the federal government since 1992. Before joining the MPS, she worked with the BIA as a water rights specialist and the Forest Service as the Southwest Regional Tribal Liaison. In 2006, she transferred to serve as the superintendent of Devil's Tower National Monument. She then became the superintendent of Montezuma Castle and Tuzigoot National Monuments in 2012. She served as an MPS representative on the Department of the Interior government to government team, which developed the DOI national consultation policy along with tribal leaders, signed by Secretary Salazar in 2011. She also was on the board of Circle, the MPS Tribal Employee Resource Group. On October 11, 2020, Ms. Firecloud became the MPS Native American Affairs Liaison, assistant to the director in the Washington, D.C. office. So welcome to the show. We're excited to have you. Oh, well, thank you. Hello, everyone. It's my honor to be with you today. I am speaking with you from the ancestral homelands of the Hopi, Apache, Yalapai, Zuni, Pima, Maricopa, and Atam, who have all lived in the Verde Valley of Arizona at various times in the past and used the area as a major trade route between coastal, southwest, and plains tribes. The Verde Valley to this day still has what remains of over 800 pueblos varying in size from a few families to several hundred inhabitants. And the valley is still currently tribal homelands of the combined Yavapai and Apache nations. So thank you for having me. All right. So, okay. I imagine that you weren't, you know, a little kid playing in the sandbox thinking that you were going to head up National Park Service tribal consultation. So what was your first interest in this type of work and, and how did you, yeah, how did you get interested in this kind of work? Well, you know, growing up as a little kid on a reservation, I didn't really understand the concept of natural resources. You know, I grew up along the Little White River in South Dakota on the Rosewood Reservation and just enjoyed being out there in nature. And back then, you know, we didn't focus a whole lot on watching TV or we didn't have computers, iPhones, any of that stuff. So, you know, a lot of our days were spent out, you know, walking around, swimming and doing all these other things. And it, so even though I didn't like give it that kind of a thought, I think that's where my real passion began as far as natural resources. So when I attended law school at in Albuquerque there at the University of New Mexico, I focused on natural resource law and kind of went on from there. And during law school, I clerked with the U.S. Attorney's Office in their water rights division. And it just kind of grew from there. And then that was how I got into the Bureau of Indian Affairs with their water rights program. Huh. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit more about the the type of work that you were doing once you got into to water rights issues? Yeah. With the U.S. Attorney's Office there in Albuquerque is the only office of its kind that deals specifically with water rights settlements. And they had a U.S. attorney there, Herb Becker, who did that work for them. And it was really awesome that he actually took the time to have a lot of the Native American law students clerk for him and learn about water rights and other natural resources. And so we worked, you know, the Amit case was a big one. 
we worked on the Navajo Hopi water rights settlement and various others throughout the United States. So when I graduated from law school and trying to decide what to do, a position for water rights specialist came up open in the Phoenix area office. So I applied and got that. And that was kind of how I got started. During the time that I worked with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, I had also been afforded the opportunity to work directly with Zuni Pueblo. So I went out there and worked for two years on an intergovernmental personnel agreement, which allows any federal employee to work with a tribe or other, like an NGO, and doing the job there. But you're still that, like Zuni Pueblo paid my salary, but I was still a federal employee. And so Um, What they had wanted me to do was to help develop their water rights program and also to train a tribal employee or a tribal person from Zuni to take over the program once I left, which I did. And she proved to be highly successful because the Zuni water rights settlement was completed from the very beginning to the end within an eight year span, which is almost virtually unheard of when doing a water rights settlement. Yeah. Yeah. Once we did that, then going back to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, I wasn't able to get back into my old position because I had been gone for a couple of years and they needed somebody in there. So I was given an option of different positions. So I went up to work with Hopi at the Hopi Agency there in Kings Canyon, Arizona for a couple of months and in the administrative office. And it wasn't something that really interested me as much as, you know, working in, in natural resources. And one day I was walking by and there was a fax coming into the, you know, on the fax machine when we had, you know, used the fax a whole lot back then as compared to scanning now. But this fax was coming in. So I picked it up and I looked at it and it was announcing a position within the U.S. Forest Service there in Albuquerque as a regional tribal liaison. And I'm like, wow, this looks really interesting. So I took a look at it and decided then to apply for that position and it seemed, you know, something that was more in line with with my education as well as my interests. And so I applied for that. Was, you know, honored to become their first regional tribal liaison and worked there in the regional office in Albuquerque up until 2006, when I had I had during the time I was with the U.S. Forest Service, I had gone over and done a couple of detail assignments. I did one as a district ranger there in Albuquerque up on the Sandia Mountains and really enjoyed the time there. And then I had gone out to Alaska and had the real fortunate opportunity to be the acting district ranger on the Tongass National Forest in Huna, Alaska there. And that was an exceptional experience. And so when I came back from there, I thought at that point in my career, I really didn't want to be like working behind a desk. I wanted to kind of be out more in nature and being able to actually make a difference in how lands were managed. And so I ended up having another great opportunity to be acting as the deputy forest supervisor on the Black Hills National Forest with the Black Hills being a significant sacred area for Lakota people. So I went up there and was there for, gosh, probably about eight months. And during that time, I was fortunate enough to meet Gerard Baker, who was the superintendent at Mount Rushmore National Monument at that time. And, you know, started visiting with him and learning more about, you know, what the Park Service did and kind of becoming a little bit more interested in that agency than I had ever before. My detail ended then in May of that year. So I went back to Albuquerque and was doing my regional tribal liaison work and saw that the position as superintendent at Devil's Tower had opened. And Devil's Tower is known to the tribe that I'm from as Mato Tipula, which is either Lodge or Home of the Bear. And so, you know, growing up, you had heard a lot of those stories. And so I thought, you know, this would be really a cool opportunity for me to go work there. So I applied and fortunately I was able to have been offered the position there and, you know, jumped on that and stayed up there for quite a number of years. And I think I would probably still be there, except I had a younger son who had decided that he wanted to go to college at ASU, Arizona State University there in Tempe. And so then we started, or I started then looking for jobs down in Arizona 
And right after Kathy Davis, who is the superintendent at Montezuma Castle in Tuzigut, decided to retire. So then that was how I ended up moving down to Arizona. And in Albuquerque, I lived there for years and years. And I, I love the Southwest. And this will probably be where I retire eventually. But so the position came open, perfect you know, timing. And so I was then fortunate enough to move down here. And I've been, or I was the superintendent there at Montezuma Castle in Tuzigut for eight years. So, yeah, you know, it's still a really pretty special place to me. And I think I'll always have that connection with all three of the monuments that I worked. Okay, so before we keep moving forward, Mm -hmm. since we're talking about, you know, Devil's Tower National Monument or, or Bears Lodge and the Black Hills, Could you maybe talk about what that meant for you to work in those two places as a a Lakota person? Yeah, it was a lot of times, you know, when I when I got to both places, it was it was always kind of made kind of like a big deal. Like, well, you're the first Native woman that's you know been in this position or, you know, as a line officer within the the Black Hills National Forest, even though it was just an acting position there. And then when I went into Devil's Tower, you know, it was, well, you're the first Native person to be the superintendent here. But as superintendent, I viewed myself more as like a caretaker, you know, of this place. And we're not the first caretakers, tribal caretakers of these places. I mean, they've been taken care of by tribal people for hundreds, if not thousands upon thousands of years prior to that. So we need to acknowledge that our ancestors had that role prior to the people that are coming through the system now. Right, right. And so, you know, just, you know, hearing those stories growing up and then being able to work at those places and help to take care of them was really extra special. It gave you a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And for those who may not know the significance of the Black Hills, could you maybe give a a little bit of background on that? Mm -hmm. So for Lakota people, the Black Hills are the heartbeat of the world. And if you take a look at it from like an aerial shot up above, it actually has the shape of a human heart. And so for Lakota people, it was where like if you were sick or you needed time to yourself to heal internally, spiritually, any way that you needed healing, that was the place to go. So a lot of times people would go there for that kind of healing, but also in times past, like Devil's Tower, a significant story that happened there for tribal people was that was where the pipe was given to us and the seven ceremonies that go along with the pipe bundle that is taken care of by Arva Looking Horse t- to this day. And the story that was is associated with that is that the tribal people, the Lakota people were camping near the tower and it had been a time of lack of resources so you know there the food wasn't there the northern part of the black hills is also viewed as kind of like a kitchen area where people would go because there was so much there to be eaten you know from animals to berries to plants you know all this different kind of stuff so they had been camping in the area and they had sent out a couple of of native warriors to go looking for buffalo or for elk or for deer, anything there that they could bring home back to the tribe for sustenance. And they had gone out quite a ways and they were walking along and they could see this woman coming towards them. And as she got closer, one of the Native men saw that she was spiritual and that he should honor her and think of her in a good way. The other, however, had more visions and had thoughts that weren't as pure as the other person. And so when she got close, she asked the one who didn't have the pure thoughts about her to come closer to him. And the other warrior said that when when he got close to her, then this like a fog appeared or a cloud appeared around the two of them. And when it dissipated that the other man laid as a pile of bones at her feet. And then she came to him and she said, you know, she told him, go back to your people and tell them to prepare. And I will come to the tribe in four days and I will have a gift for you at that time. So he went back and he told the people to get ready. They did. They prepared. And in four days she came and with her, she brought the bundle, which contained the pipe that is so sacred to Lakota people. 
at this time. And she brought it and she also taught us the four different ceremonies that went along with, with the pipe. And so that story is one of the stories that's told there at um, Mato Tipila. And then, you know, of course, another story that is told there is just of, of the little kids that were running in and playing in the area. And they were having a good time. The brother was chasing the seven sisters and they were running and laughing. And all of a sudden, the little brother turned into a bear and was chasing them. So they jumped, the sisters jumped on the rock. The rock took him up in the air and, and the bear, is, the brother is scratching on the sides. And that was how the tower formed. And the sisters then went up into the heavens and become Pleiades, which are the seven sisters. So those are just a couple of the stories that are related to that time. And to this very day in June during the summer solstice is when a lot of tribal people will go there to for ceremonial purposes, although they do come there all year round. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was, I'm sure, an issue that you had to deal with when you were superintendent at, at Devil's Tower with mm -hmm. the, the climbing ban and the, the situation there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we didn't have have a climbing ban. So. Oh, right. Okay. So do you want to maybe give us some better background? So, yeah, at one point, the National Park Service attempted to do a climbing ban there at the tower because of the, the sacredness of the place. However, it was not meant to be at the time. And so the Park Service met with the tribal elders. The tribal elders at that time said, you know, we really don't want a ban. We don't want a ban on, on climbers. What we would really prefer to do is that the Park Service educate the climbers enough that climbers are then able to make that decision for themselves. And at some point, hopefully, then the climbers will, you know, by making that decision for themselves, it gives a, a greater credibility than for the park service to tell them, no, you can't find this place because of its sacredness. So. Right. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds like, I mean, obviously it took a long time and there was some bitterness for a while there, but it sounds like from my understanding that the, the relationship has really gotten a lot better and that, what is the name of that climbing organization? <laughs> but that they have taken an, an active stand advocating for the, the voluntary closure. Yeah, they, they've been very good about being supportive of the voluntary closure. So every year, like towards the beginning of June in that area, the Park Service will come out with, you know, like an email or just a poster that says, you know, during this time, even though it's kind of like all year round, but also Earlier in the spring is when we have the peregrine falcons that are there. And a lot of times the falcons will nest on, on the tower. So that's really the only time that we would go in there and say, okay, this route to this route is closed to climbing because the falcons are nesting there and we didn't want to disturb you know, their parenting abilities at that time. <laughs> and raising the little ones. And so once the younger falcons did pledge, then after that time, we were able to open that those areas back up. And the climbers were very, very respectful. Good, good. All right. Well, we are already at our first break. And while we're on break, I'm going to look up the name of this climbing organization so we can share it with you all. But yeah, we will be right back and continue with you on your, your journey. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to zencastr.com and use the code HEVO, H-E-V-O. If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat, literally. But don't sweat it, Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations, including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1-800-GRANGER, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. 
At your job, do you ever have to deal with a nose roller? How about a snub pulley? Well, if you're installing a new conveyor belt system, dealing with the different components can sound like you're speaking a foreign language. Luckily, you've got a team ready to help. Granger's technical product specialists are fluent in maintenance, repair, and operations. So whenever you want to talk shop, just reach out. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. We are back from our break, and we uh, used the break as an opportunity to look it up. And it is the Access Fund that has written articles for the climbing community about why you should honor the the June closure at Devil's Tower. And we can include a couple of those articles in the show notes if you're interested in reading about them. And while we were on break, you also mentioned some other collaborations between them and the park, if, if you want to touch on that real quick. Yeah, the Access Fund you know, actually really became a great partner for the National Park Service. And one of the things that we would try to do every year was we would hold a cleanup around the tower, like from the trail. If you've ever been up there, the trail goes all the way around the base of the tower. So from the trail into the, up to the base of the tower, they would come in and have a bunch of volunteers come in and clean up that whole area. So, you know, that saved us quite a bit of funds and it assured, you know, that it was kept clean. So th- that was a great, great partnership that we worked on. And I think another, there's a documentary that was put out it's called In the Light of Reverence by Toby McLeod with Bull, Bullfrog Films is, is who put it out. But it's got a really great story. It tells a story from the local community perspective, the climber perspective, as well as the tribal perspective. So it kind of brings it all in together there. And so I would recommend that for people who want to know more about what, what was going on during that time. And also just to remind people, you know, in 1868, the treaty was signed there at Fort Laramie, which guaranteed that the Black Hills would remain within that ownership because Lakota people, we don't claim ownership of land. But just within the Aboriginal area was the Black Hills. And so, and then about three, four years later, I mean, it, was, it wasn't very long that gold was then discovered in the Black Hills and it was taken away without, you know, so the treaty was broken. However, it's not been broken on the side of the tribal Lakota people. And so, you know, a lot of times you'll hear that the Black Hills are not for sale. And there was an actual court settlement that gave the Lakota people a few billion dollars in exchange for the Black Hills back to the 18, like 70 values, which wasn't very much, but it was still a few billion dollars. And that amount has been sitting in a bank for, gosh, 40 50 years now, and it's grown to be a fairly significant amount of money. And you need to remember that Lakota people back in South Dakota are some of the poorest counties. They usually come up as number one, two, or three of the poorest counties in the United States. However, they have refused to take the funds for the Black Hills because as far as Lakota people, we view it as the fact that the Black Hills are not for sale. They've never been for sale and we have not accepted the funding. Therefore, the Black Hills still are within our ancestral ownership. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, yeah, a, just a powerful statement of, of what, going, tying back to what you were talking about before about, you know, how important the place is yeah. mm-hmm. to Lakota people. And it's just such a strong testimony to that fact. Mm-hmm. You know, it would be so easy just to accept the money because the people are so poor. But, you know, like I had talked about earlier, you know, if you're feeling sick or you need that kind of mental, psychological healing, that's the place where you would go. So, I mean, there's no way that you could sell something like that, especially, you know, from the tribal perspective. Yeah, I was listening to a, a YouTube video that you did in prepping for this and you talked about how you you were always taught that basically for every ailment there is an herb mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i would imagine the black hills being such a you know naturally diverse type of place that that would add to the significance as well yeah it's a very very powerful place and so you know it's not a place that you go to 
you know, for recreational purposes. It's a place that you would go for healing. And everything that you needed to heal was there. Yeah. So, you know, not to to change from, you know, it's always hard to turn away from such important discussions. Mm -hmm. But I know that we were talking about, you know, your journey and, you know, where you went after working as a superintendent at Devil's Tower and after you at the Black Hills and Montezuma Castle. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, we kind of left off with where you were at at Montezuma Castle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you want to talk about any of your experiences while you were there? And then we can, you know, talk about your your current position. Okay. Yeah. Um, Montezuma Castle, you know, is an awesome cliff. You know, it's, it's built within the cliff side there and it's very well preserved the kind of cool thing about this is devil's tower is the first national monument that was created under the antiquities act montezuma castle is either second or third because it was created a few months later but whether or not Hmm. the legislation that was signed by the president was for el malpais and el moro or montezuma castle because they were signed at the same time so it kind of goes back and forth and i think Unfortunately, Montezuma Castle may have been third. <laughs> but anyway, those two parks were, <laughs> or those two monuments were signed the same day. We'll give you credit for it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it would have been cool to have worked at the first one, then the second one, my second job. So it's, anyway, so yeah. <laughs> but at one, yeah, at, you know, when Montezuma Castle was first open, we allowed visitors into the castle itself, but that was done. I mean, we ended up not allowing visitors back in kind of like in the mid 1950s because it was just becoming too fragile. And then the number of visitors that we were getting to was really greatly increasing. And so we just didn't want to do more harm to it. So now a few times when you're there, you may see ladders that are going up there and some of the park service employees working there. We have our cultural resource crew is all the masons are made up of Hopi gentlemen that go up there and do all of the the maintenance on the castle and at Tuzigut at the Pueblo itself. So we try to keep it as culturally significant with with the repairs as well in, to this day, which I feel like is, is really important. And, you know, they were the ones that, you know, their ancestors were some of the people that created those places in the first place. So I think it's only right that that they're the ones that remain to be the actual caretaker of, of those places. But Montezuma Well, which is a subunit of Montezuma Castle, and it's a few miles north of Montezuma Castle, is very significant. It's the emergent story for the Yavapai people. And any place, you know, like the Black Hills, the emergent story for the Lakota people is Wind Cave. And so a lot of the park sites are these highly significant places for tribal people throughout the United States. And you'll hear about their emergent stories. And part of the emergent story is that you can't go back, you know, where you came from, because this is where you're meant to be today and stuff. And so it was really nice. The tribal people would still still come to Montezuma Well to do ceremonial purposes. They'll come do baby naming ceremonies. They come for when the young lady becomes a young woman for that type of ceremonies. And so I felt really honored to be able to be at at all three of these sites within the National Park Service. So it it made it very difficult to then apply for the Washington position because I was going back to like the desk job and to being inside and not having that connection. But I really think it's important right now for me to be in this in the position that I'm in right now. And it's right, you know, at the end of my career. And I think I can make some really significant changes within the park service for tribal people, for tribal park service employees and for the partnership with tribes. So is there anything in particular that you're hoping to accomplish or build upon in this new position? Well, you know, Pat Parker had been the original person who had been in the position and she had been in the position since it was first established up until, gosh, it was established in the 1990s. And then unfortunately, Pat Parker passed away in 2016. 
So when Pat Parker passed away, then Joe Watkins, who was in the Office of Cultural Resources, then took on those duties in addition to his program management duty over cultural resources. So there wasn't a permanent position dedicated to the position anymore. But he also had quite a few staff people that he worked with that were able to assist him with a lot of this stuff. And so like the Tribal Historic Preservation Office was in there, you know, which deals directly with tribes and funding for their Tribal Historic Preservation Office. And so, you know, it all kind of came together there. And unfortunately, Joe ended up retiring a couple of years after that. And so once he left, then we had a number of different people acting within the position while they were trying to determine, you know, if they needed to put it back into its own office or if they were going to keep it there. And fortunately, Jennifer Talkin Spalding was the last person who had it. And she did an awesome job of keeping it moving forward and then worked with David Bella, who was the acting director of the National Park Service the last couple of years. And they both worked really hard to get it to where it's at now and making the decision that, yes, it would be you know, its own program area and that it would be reporting directly to the director as well as sitting within what they call the hallway of the director and elevate it to a level that it needed to be at to ensure that it was the true government to government relationship that it needed to be. Okay, so building off of of that history where it's it's now going to be this new program, do you have any specific goals that you'd like to accomplish while you're you're in this position? Oh yeah, there's lots. You know, when I first started looking at whether or not to even apply for the position because it was, you know, in the office and the desk again, I started thinking about a lot of the things, you know, when I had worked with the U.S. Forest Service earlier, we had really transformed that office over there. And then we had started out with a, a team of 10 people that went in to look at their office, which at that time just composed of one person and looked at all the things that Forest Service needed to do to really have a great Native American, you know, tribal liaison office. And one of the things that we were able to do back then was to create the office and and get a budget of $2 million that was just for that. So right now, Reed Robinson is the new executive director over there, and he just moved there from, and he had been a regional tribal liaison for the National Park Service. So he's now the the program manager for the U.S. Forest Service of their Native American Affairs Office. So there's his position plus five full-time staff members that he has with a full-time budget of around $2 million. And so... You know, when we did all of that work for the Forest Service, then I, you know, I kind of have these grand ideas like, gosh, what if we did you know, for the Park Service what we did for the U.S. Forest Service back then and create this, you know, this program, a decent program? Because when Pat was there, she had a staff, I think, of four full time staff members at one time. And so, you know, all of that went away along with the funding. So it's like, okay, we're going to have to sit down and look at staffing possibilities as well as uh, developing a budget. So, I mean, it's really starting like the program all over again. So there's just so many possibilities right now this year. One of the things I'd really like to focus on in George McDowell is the NPS youth program manager. And I've been working closely with him. We just had what was called the Dingle Act. And the very last section of the Dingle Act is the John McCain Act within the Dingle Act. And the John McCain portion of that deals specifically with the Indian Youth Service Corps and ways that the federal government can have actual direct hire authority for Native youth as well as Native Hawaiian youth to work in natural resource fields. So it's like with the Park Service, you know, with Fish and Wildlife, with BLM, with Bureau of Reclamation. So we have these direct hire authorities. And so it's right now the guidance is going out in the Federal Register. So the tribes and the Native Hawaiian communities need to be aware of that and start looking at that. And if they want to comment on that, because Park Service has funding available right now that we can start hiring some of those youth. And it doesn't have to be just with a federal agency. You know, the internships and these other programs can be with like 
Conservation Legacy, who does a lot of those kinds of programs already, or, you know, within the Park Service or with the like Bureau of Indian Affairs or with the tribes themselves if they want to develop internships. So it's just a really great opportunity for tribal youth to gain, you know, some employment in job skills. So I think that's one that I really want to focus on. Another one that I would really like to focus on is development of tourism programs within and for tribes. Dark skies are, I mean, just a, you know, I just view those as just an awesome opportunity because Native American people have some of the best lands within the United States. Native Hawaiians have some of the best lands within Hawaii and those islands. And so, you know, and their stories, the stories that they have related to night skies are really important. And there are things that, you know, that can be done with those. And at Montezuma Castle and Tuzigut, we had just submitted the dark sky application for those parks. And within the Verde Valley here, I mean, Sedona was like one of the very first communities to get dark sky not- notification. The village of Oak Creek has theirs. Cottonwood got theirs, Camp Verde recently got theirs. So with the inclusion of the two national monuments here within the Verde Valley, the Verde Valley will be completely protected by dark skies and the protections that we had agreed to as being part of a dark sky community. So, you know, within reservations, I can just see so much potential there for tourism, not only related to to the dark skies, but, you you know, all the other things that there's rivers, there's mountains, there's hiking, there's, you know, there's just so much potential there. The American Indian Alaska Native Tourism Association has a cultural tourism heritage certificate that is a six-week program that is just really, really a great program. It helps tribal people to you know, to look at tourism on a whole different plane than what they had normally been doing. And I took that the first year that it was put out, and I've been fortunate enough to be invited back every year as a guest speaker to help with just laying the basic foundation of that first week and helping the students get motivated to finish up the six weeks. It's a lot of work, but it's really well worth it. And so that's another one that I'd really like to take a look at. And, you know, like I said just before, looking at other possibilities of ways that the Park Service can work with tribes, the Grand Canyon National Park is doing some awesome stuff right now. There's an area within the park that's called Desert View, and they're taking that whole area and converting it into a destination within Grand Canyon. It's always been a destination, but it's going to be highlighted on tribal artisans. And so you'll be able to go there and they'll have, you know, like during the summer months or when it's nicer. So it might be like nine months out of the year where you'll actually have artisans that are there displaying their goods as well as, you know, showing people, you know, how it's made and different things like that. And it's going to be a significant area. So, I mean, there's those kinds of opportunities and I'm hoping that, you know, it's kind of a unique area within Grand Canyon now, but I'm hoping that once they get it going and people see how successful it can be, that other parks will also start incorporating more of those areas. One of the things that I've noticed within the National Park Service is that we don't have any site that's specific to the civil rights of tribal people. And, you know, we kind of, you know, we have one that talks about it a little bit, which is Alcatraz and the takeover that was done there back in the late 60s, early 70s. And so they talk about like right now, if you went to the Golden Gate webpage, you would see that they're they're actually hosting a 19 month virtual exhibit, which began in November of 2019. It's entitled Red Power on Alcatraz, Perspective 50 Years Later. So, you know, I would really recommend to people to go there. They have a short video and they have some really nice pictures and stories about the occupation that went on there. So, I mean, there's just so much that, I mean, there's so much possibilities. It's really like whatever I can make of the job. But then at the same time, right now, we're developing a work plan and I have a team of like nine or 10 people that are assisting me with this. 
And so we're going to make, make sure that it's as comprehensive as possible and that I'm not, you know, leaving out anything. We have someone from Hawaii, that a native Hawaiian that's on there. We have a couple of Alaska natives that are on there. We have a Hopi gentleman, a Cheyenne River gentleman. We have, you know, and so people from like the East Coast, you know, so we're getting all of these people's perspectives in there and we're going to develop a work plan that will be comprehensive, but then still at the same time, leave it open because I'm sure, you know, that there's always going to be things that be can be included. And then once we finish something that that will drop off and other things will take its place. So lots and lots of potential. Yeah, there's lots of exciting stuff there. So we are already at our second break. Time flies, Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) but we will come back and talk more about this work here in a minute. Hello, it's Jim Eagle. Please join us for the Bay Area American Indian Two-Spirit Society's 11th Annual Two-Spirit Powell in person or online this year at San Francisco Fort Mason Center on Saturday, February 12th, 2022. Gore dance at noon and grand entry begins at 1 p.m. There will be over 60 vendors selling all types of indigenous products and crafts. Powell dancers from all over the U.S. will be competing in contests all day long. We'll also be having several delicious fry bread taco vendors. For more information, go to Bates.org. That's B-A-A-I-T-S dot org. COVID protocols will be in effect. See you there. All right, we're back from our break. And one thing that I was really hoping that we could talk about today is consultation during a pandemic, because obviously everything is weird and different right now. And consultation is difficult because, you know, we're used to having those meetings in person and that's just not something that's as much of an option right now. So do you have any advice or what's your experience been with consultation during this 2020 COVID pandemic? And it is, it's, it's changed so much because, you know, a tribal people, especially tribal consultation, it's always best to do it in person, either at the parks or a lot of times I would recommend to park staff go to the tribes, you know, if you ever have an opportunity to do the tribal consultation at tribal lands, then do it. I remember we had wanted to do a project and we had sent our letter off to, I think it was Gila River, asking them to sign off for us to do this project. And we had sent the letter off to everybody else, all the other tribes that we consulted with. And Gila River came back and said, no. And the park staff was like, no, they've already agreed to part one, but we never went back to give them the results of part one. And so we didn't explain to them that we weren't able to get the testing that we needed. And so this was to go back and retest those same areas to make sure of the it had to do with dates. And so we went down there, met with them, and we walked out with the, the letter saying yes, you know, so a lot of times not only inviting them to the parks, but go to the reservations as well, which is like pre-COVID, but ever since COVID started, so right before I left Montezuma Castle and Tuzigu, we were getting ready to do our, it wasn't really truly tribal consultation, but we would do every year park planning. So we would get together and one day we would do um, our meetings with the four Southern tribes And the second day we would meet with like Salt River, Gila River and the Pai tribes. And then the last day we would meet with Hopi. And we had, you know, it was Tonto National Monument, our parks, Casa Grande. So it was a number of parks then that would come together and meet with all these tribes. And so we decided, you know, now that we're going to do it through teams, which a lot of the tribes had access to. So the first day, you know, with the four Southern tribes went off without a hitch and Each park had their PowerPoint, so we went through each one of our projects that we were going to do, got those all done, you know, got questions from the tribes, got approval to move forward with those projects. The second day, again, teams went off without a hitch and got all those tribes up to date on what we were doing for this year for planning, what we had completed the year before. The third day then was with Hopi. And you have to remember that this year, Hopi and Navajo have been hit extremely hard. So they had their offices shut down for quite an extended length of time. And so when it came time for Hopi, you know, we were all on the phone getting ready, you know, to do all these presentations again. 
and nothing. So we waited and we waited and finally got a call from, you know, the Chippo there at Hopi. And he was like, we were not able to get our IT back up and running again. So let's see what we can do. So then we agreed, well, let's wait for a couple hours while his IT people came in and try to fix it there at the tribe. And then, so then everybody called back in and he thought everything was fixed. There we tried it to go again and, and same kind of issues. So what we ended up doing was saying, okay, well, what we're going to go ahead to do is just go ahead and postpone it for the day and reschedule it at a later date when they had more time to get everything kind of up and going again there at the offices. So, you know, there's those issues that are going on. So some tribes have that capability. A lot of the, especially smaller tribes, you know, that are more remote than others, you're going to have that connectivity issue going on right now with having to do the virtual consultation, virtual meetings. So I know we're getting ready. There's this really cool cultural tourism class that's given by George Washington University in the first week. I think, as I've told you, I've been able to be a guest speaker. And so one of the topics that we're really going to focus on this year is COVID and the impact to tourism and look at short term and long term planning in in this era of pandemic, because right now tourism is being hit extremely hard. People aren't traveling as much as they used to. They're traveling a little bit more locally. So with the national parks, we're Actually, some of the parks are experiencing some of their highest visitation because people feel feel safer going out to parks than a lot of the other places that they would normally. I mean, there's no like the movie theaters aren't open as much, you know, like bowling, all of those kinds of things are being impacted. So we're having to look at other means of doing that. Jennifer Talkin Spalding, who you know had been acting my role before I got in, her and I are going to be doing a taping in January for park service employees and other people, federal agencies, maybe even tribal people who then want to watch that video. And we're going to be giving kind of, yeah, advice as how to do consultation during COVID and remembering different things. Cause there's so many things that are going on that you wouldn't even think of. Like I know forest service had gotten some complaints because there was an elder that had been speaking and somehow they were muted. And so, you know, just, So nobody heard what the tribal elder had to say. Yeah. So there was things like that. And what Forest Service, I think, had done was they had um, opened it up so everybody had control. And I think somebody accidentally thought that they were muting it just for themselves, but it was muting it for the entire audience. So people that should have been listening to what this elder had to say then did what didn't hear. And so it really caused some issues. So there's little things like that that you wouldn't even think of that you have to really make sure that you're addressing. So, you know, it's, it's a difficult process, but then at the same time, if you get, get it kind of in a routine, then at least from the federal government side, then you're going to be able to work with the tribes and still get that information out there that you want. That sounds, that sounds scary (laughs) with the elder. Oh, that's awful. Yeah, because I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, yeah, it was it was a horrible mistake. But, you know, it's something that's so new that we're all going to be you know, making mistakes at different times and stuff. And it's just something that, you know, that you learn from and then go on. But make sure that that you're giving that educational experience, you know, like well, we did this and it really didn't work and getting it out there. And we're even thinking about developing like a like a one page kind of brochure kind of thing that for all, you know, DOI federal agencies and maybe we'd share with the Forest Service. And then I need to get a hold of Freed Robinson over there and see, you know, what they've been experiencing as well and and his recommendations is what to do with consultation during this time. Yeah. Well, if any of those are end up being available to the, the general public, send them send them our way and we can attach them to the show notes. Oh great. We'll be sure to do that. Yeah. The next question that I have you know, I mean, obviously the National Park Service has like like any other agency, you know, within the US, it has some history with indigenous people. And I know that the Park Service has been doing a lot to try and to try and fix that history. What do you think that the the Park Service could do just to make indigenous people feel more welcome at uh, National Park Service sites? Well, I think 
you know, even going before like the welcoming and stuff like that, I think one of the things that we could do is really focus on trying to get tribal employees. I kind of like to um, close this, the story today with s- some positive things. So, but one of the things I think that we really need to do in order to even make Native American people feel welcome is to hire tribal people. Because I was listening to this podcast. It was actually a talk on an international monuments program a couple of weeks ago. And so they were talking about civil rights in some of the park service sites there. And I noticed that the superintendents at these sites were all African Americans. And I thought, you know, who better, who better to be in charge of those places than those whose ancestors, whose families have lived that. They have it, you know, like it's in their DNA. They know those stories on a on so much a more personal basis than anybody else, you know, and they're going to be able to direct their staff in the direction that it needs to go in how to interpret these sites. So when I was thinking about that, I was thinking, okay, so with Native Americans sites, you know, there's a few of us superintendents out there that are Native American, but overall, I think the percentage of Native American employees within National Park Service is less than 2%. It's not very much. Gerard Baker, you know, made huge headways and helped to get a lot of of American Indian people into the Park Service, including myself. But so I would recommend, you know, for people that want to become park rangers, you you can become a park ranger and have any kind of educational background that you want. And I came in with the JD. Other people have come in with English, you know, English degrees in English as teachers, as nurses, as as law enforcement. I mean, you can there's anything that you could possibly have have gone to school for and learned about you can use within the National Park Service. There's something waiting for you. And I would really recommend to Native people, to Indigenous students, you know, to Hispanic students, to any minority students that are out there, anybody who wants to work within the National Park Service, please look at it as a, as a place to work. It is one of the greatest jobs that you will ever have. And, you know, right now we've, you know, like with the Indian Youth Service Corps that's coming out, we're going to have direct hire for Native students and for Native Hawaiians. But they've changed the laws a little bit the last couple of years. If you're a veteran, you can apply for jobs regardless of, you know, how much time that you've put in there. So, and I know that Native Americans, the percentage of veterans within us is high. So if you want to become a park ranger and you're a veteran, you have that in. The other option is to have worked as a seasonal employee. You know, I have a granddaughter who's a park ranger and when she decided she wanted to become a park ranger, she started looking at ways, you know, that she could think about doing it. And she, so first she went to work for the bookstore. She volunteered at the bookstore first, and then she became a seasonal employee at the bookstore and worked her way that way. Then she became a seasonal park ranger, and she worked as a seasonal park ranger for several seasons. And once you have 24 months of federal employment under your belt, which can include also as being working through the Conservation Legacy Program, Land Conservation Corps, ACE, Peace Corps, any of those programs. After you have 24 months, you can apply to become a permanent National Park Service employee. So there's lots of avenues to get in. So if if you're thinking about that, give me a call. There's Circle that has lots of Native American NPS employees that are available to help. Give me a call. Give Circle a call. Um, we can provide all that contact information onto the webinar after for the podcast. But so back to your question about, you know, a lot of times Native American people have not been made to feel welcome to parks. And a lot of that, you know, kind of went back to those days of you know not being able to practice our religion there at parks because it was like in the 1880s, 1890s, around that time with the Code of Indian Offenses that Native American people weren't allowed to practice their religion anymore. And it wasn't until 1970 with the passage of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act that Native people could 
openly practice their religion. So we never had that same guarantee under the Constitution that the rest of the United States citizens did. And so with that, they just never were Devil's Tower, Mato Tipula. It was a significant sacred site for Lakota people, but yet we weren't allowed to go there for ceremonial purposes until in the 1970s. And it hasn't been that long ago. That's what, 50 years? 50 years is not very long in our history. So within that, with the passage of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act also was the time that federal land managers then had to change the way that they actually took care of these lands because now there was this whole new usage that was coming into the, onto lands, federal lands that hadn't been there before. But so then at that time, then, you know, native people, would then go to the parks and and you could get in for, you know, you can get into parks for free if you're Native American. So, you know, but a lot of people talked about the fact that they would have to do so much explaining, you know, like, I'm here for this, you know, I'm here for cultural purposes. And then the park ranger would be like, you know, well, what exactly do you mean cultural purposes, you know, and stuff. And so then they would have to feel, you know, really obligated to talk about things that they didn't really want to share freely because it's not information that that you're allowed to be telling other people. So there was like this, do we, so a lot of times people were still paying to get in because they didn't want to have to go through all of that. So I remember like when I first went to Devil's Tower, one day I was um, driving out of the park. It was the end of the day, so I was leaving and I was driving out of the park I noticed this bus driving in and I turned to look and it was it's on the side of the bus it said St. Francis Indian School and I was like wait you know how cool is this you know it's from Rosebud the school is on the Rosebud Indian Reservation and I had actually attended St. Francis for one year as a as a boarding school student and so I was really happy and I thought oh this is really cool so I turned my car around and the bus was going up the hill so I followed it up and it was after regular like business hours and it was a time of the year it was like late fall. And so there wasn't a lot of visitation, but the whole parking lot was empty. So the bus driver had pulled over to the side and, and parked like, you know, parallel to the trailhead. So he took up like about five, five parking spots there. And I parked behind him and I went running over there, not even thinking that here I am in uniform you know, looking like an authority, our uniforms are based at, you know, off military. So it's got that look. So I go running over there. And then as soon as I get there, you could see, you know, like close the whole mood of everybody because everybody is like really happy getting off the bus, you know, talking and visiting with one another. And then they turn and they see me coming. And the bus driver is like, I'm just parking here for a few minutes. I'm just trying to unload, you know, the students so they can get to the trailhead along with the, with the elders. And, you know, so he starts explaining to me like right away what's going on. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You know, you know, my name is Dorothy Firecloud. You know, I'm the park superintendent here, but I'm from Rose, but I suddenly went to school at St. Francis for a year. And I just wanted to welcome you here and let you know how happy, you know, I feel, you know, to see you guys driving into the park and just wanted to say hello. But it really made me stop and think, you know, how tribal people feel and actually seeing it myself. So, you know, so I've kind of made it a point to make sure, you know, with my park staff or with different park staff or different people that I talk to that work within the park service to ensure that they're always making tribal people feel welcome. And we've, I think we've come quite a long ways within the park service because we've taught a lot of our employees don't ask a whole lot of the questions. It's really, you know, if they say they're there for cultural purposes, fine. We don't need to know specifics, you know, let them through. I remember our regional director, Mike Snyder, saying, he goes, tribal people don't go to parks to recreate in large numbers. He goes, and if a few, you know, are there he goes so what he goes it's there's such a small number that it's not even going to make a blip on on our floria funding and so but i think what i would like to do is end my talk today with a couple of stories of change and how tribal people are being welcomed to national park service sites first i remember 
I was reading this story in Facebook and it really uh, made an impression on me. And I, I sent it to the staff at Devil's Tower because I wanted them to see, you know, this, this story. And it was, a, I'd say like a middle-aged tribal woman and she was driving up to Devil's Tower and she had her grandmother with her and they had, I think there was a sick member in the family or something anyway. So the night before they had sat up late making all these prayer ties and for pr- people that don't know what prayer ties are, you know, it's kind of like a long string and there's all these. And what really reminds me is like a rosary. It's real similar to a rosary because each one of those ties represents a prayer, like with, with the rosary. So anyway, they had, so as she's approaching the kiosk, she spoke of her hesitancy as she would have to explain to the ranger why she was there. And because of prior bad experiences, she really wasn't looking forward to the exchange. So Anyway, she pulled up to the kiosk and she told the ranger she was there for ceremonial purposes. And she re- she actually started, she said to reach over to grab the box with the prayer ties in it to show it to him in case he questioned it. But she said even before she was able to do that, the ranger welcomed her and waved her in. And so she drove into the park. She talked about how overwhelmed with emotion she was that she pulled over. There's like little side Um, areas that you can pull over to watch the prairie dogs when you first get into the park. And she said she pulled over to one of those places and parked a car and she wept. She, she said, she said, I wept with relief and I wept with happiness. You know, I had that she hadn't been interrogated and instead she had been made to feel welcome. So, you know, that was a real success story, you know, and just the detail that she talked about and everything was just made me feel really, really helpful happy, you know, that the park had changed that much from when I had first gone there. And then, because I, I was talking earlier that, you know, when I first went there, I pretended to be a tourist and, and it was, and I saw then too, you know, how difficult it was for tribal people to have to explain that stuff. And then, so a couple of years ago, a friend and I decided that we wanted to go up to Mesa Verde. So we went up there And at Mesa Verde, when you get there, the visitor center is down below. So you can do all of that stuff. So we did all of the uh, stuff at the visitor center. And then as you drive into the park, there's a kiosk there where you pay. And so when when we were headed up there, I told her, I said, you're probably going to have to show your tribal ID. So she already had it ready. And she was she's a member of Cayo Pueblo, which is formerly known as Santa Domingo. And then in return, the park, re- you know, so she hands him her tribal ID. And so we're kind of both prepared to, you know, to have to do the explanation and stuff. And so the park ranger takes a look at it and he looked at her and he said, welcome home. And then he gave her a park brochure and then he waved us in. And it was, you know, I still get emotional when I think about that. And, and I've heard it from other tribal people, like from Santa Ana and others who have gone up to Mesa Verde to you know, to visit and stuff. And, and, they've, and they've talked about this ranger and how welcoming he, he is. And so I'd really like to end today with these two simple words. They're very simple words, but they are so powerful coming from a park ranger. And that was welcome. Thanks for listening to the Heritage Voices podcast. You can find show notes at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash heritage voices. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or the Google Music Store. Also, if you like the show, please share with your friends or write us a review. If you have any questions, comments, or show suggestions, please reach out to me at Jessica at livingheritageanthropology.org or you can find me on Facebook through Living Heritage Anthropology or on Twitter at Living Heritage A. As always, thank you to Lyle Blanqua and Jason Nez for their collaboration on our incredible logo. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. 
visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info. Natural litter under your feet, yeah. At least in your body.